Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 3, Ready Player 2. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to all the visitors in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. It's great of you to join us and take part in the episode. For those listening later, remember you can join us every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, especially when you can jump in the chat room and tell us that we're not making any sound. Did someone change something in the Matrix? I got some terrible deja vu here. We are, not surprisingly, still working on our technical aspects and learning as we go. I had an editing glitch this past week for episode 2 that impacted my audio, and apparently I can't figure out OBS settings for this audio. But every day is a learning experience on a new podcast, and we hope to keep improving every episode. If you want a good sounding technical episode, last episode went a little smoother than this one. <laughs> We're hoping to improve that with take 2. So we're just going to jump to a little bit of feedback. I'd like to include this on every episode. So one of the things I would love to hear is that feedback from you. If you are listening to us live, let us know in the chat room. If you're listening on the podcast, send us an email. We want to hear how things are going and we want to improve on our show. For example, Jaden W. said, don't even have kids and enjoyed your episode tonight. Nicely done. That was, of course, in reference to our kids co-op game episode. Well, thanks, Jaden. And a good family game should be as a fun for the adults as it is for the kids. I know I love Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters myself. Such a good game. Big thanks to Phil, Bob, and Chris over at Misdirected Mark for the huge shout out they gave us on episode 320, Flipping Gangbusters. Also, thanks for the vote of confidence. We'll be bigger than the Dice Tower. One can dream. It's an honor to be considered a brother podcast to Misdirected Mark, one of the best shows out there. We really appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show here in the chat room, or send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since the last time we were here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? See, things are going better. Every week, every week, every week, wow, every week I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. This is also a weekly feature at TabletopBellhop.com where I post our week in review as part of What Did You Play Mondays. Last week was a great week for reducing the pile of shame. Three games off the pile. Now, I love seeing that. Now, maybe it's self-evident, but what is a pile of shame for those people who aren't in the know? Those are those games that you were super excited about. You had to have. You pre-ordered them. You kickstarted it. You rushed to the store. You had to have it. You get it. You bring it home and you put it in a pile and it sits there. It's like that for you readers. It's that pile of books on your night table that you never got to. Just like that, but with board games. It's all the stuff you picked up that you have yet to get to the table. It's shameful. Why did I buy all this stuff if I'm not going to play it? That's why I use Pile of Shame. There are other podcasts out there that like to call it their shelf of opportunity or a shelf of wonder I've heard in Pile of Opportunity. Those were the two I've heard before. Um, I personally call it the Pile of Shame. See, I have a Pile of Shame. No, I, I have multiple Piles of Shame. Bookshelf could... of Shame just doesn't have the same ring to it. No, it doesn't. That that, But... Yeah, I probably have a. I could probably build a fort of shame in in my gaming room right now. It's a lot of games, but I worked on it. I'm trying to get the games played, and last week was fantastic for this. I, like I said I got through three of them. So starting off the top was Wasteland Express Delivery Service. This game had a ton of hype. Like people were going nuts about this thing. I think it was on Kickstarter. I don't remember off the top of my head. I didn't back it if it was. I didn't see the buzz until after the fact. And all the buzz was about, oh my God, it looks so good. 
it looks so amazing. Like there was pre-paint, not pre-painted, pre-assembled miniatures or miniatures that don't need assembly. Uh, instead of cardboard tokens, it's all plastic pieces. Instead of like a chip for food, you actually have little food crates and they fit in the trucks like really over the top production value. And then they worked with Game Trays, which is a company that make game inserts, which we'll talk more about those in next week. Game Trays made the inserts for this. So instead of having to go buy a thing to hold all the bits when you're done, it came right with the game, which is fantastic. The thing is, all I kept reading was how good the game looks. No one was talking about how how's the game? How's the mechanics? Is it good to play? Like, or, is it a good game? So we went to Origins, and one of the first places I hit was the Pandasaurus booth. That's the company that makes Wasteland Express. And they had a wall of Wasteland Express, bright colors, greens and pinks and purples. And I walk up, I'm all excited, and I'm like, I want to do a demo. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, we're not doing any demos of Wasteland Express. I'm like, well, wh why? And they're like, well, we're really trying to show off the mind. That's, that's our hot new game. And I'm like, no, I don't want to play the mine. I want to play Wasteland Express. Like, like, look, I want to play it. And they're like, well, we are showing off Dinosaur Island. I'm like, I, I backed the Kickstarter. You got my money for that one. Show me Wasteland Express. And they're like, no, sorry, we're not going to do it. it. It takes up too much room. It's a longer game. It's just, it's not good for doing demos. But if you want, we'll open one up for you. All right, cool. So they open one up for me. I take a look at it. Yeah, everything everyone says online is true. This game looks amazing. So, got back from Origins, did my research. Is the gameplay good? I just watched some videos. It, it looked pretty good, it, but it's not a cheap game. Then Amazon Prime Day hit, and it was more than 50% off. I couldn't do it. I had money spent, gone, game shipped. So, the game hit Han Solo. Han Solo brought it to Canada. Last Saturday, we got to play it. Fantastic game. Like, it looks as good as all the hype, and it plays really well. It's a pick-up-and-deliver game. So you got places on the map that have goods, and you have places on the map that want the verb between them. The thing is, it's post-apocalyptic, so think Mad Max or Borderlands. Actually, the art really looks like Borderlands, but the whole driving across the wasteland makes me think Mad Max. So a good mesh there of the two. And it's really thematic. It's really cool looking bits. They're, it's quest based. So you're not just necessarily doing pick up and deliver. Like when we played, one of them was raid the four different raider camps to because they're pissing off the company you work for, Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Uh, another one was make so many deliveries to a certain town and so on. And then even cooler in the back of the book, I didn't even know this was there. There's a whole campaign mode where you like record who won each session and it tells a story huge bonus really impressed by that i love games that tell a story and i wasn't expecting that from this i was just expecting a cool pickup and deliver game so big thumbs up for wasteland express i i strongly recommend checking that game out especially if you can find it as cheap as i did so it did uh kick start uh it did. there's a okay. lot of complaints on board game geek because apparently the only thing you got for backing it on kickstarter was 11 cards for like 30 bucks more uh, there is an entire topic for a show, Kickstarter stretch goals and my thoughts on them. Yeah. I that's... personally don't... We can go off on what... that for a long time. Yeah. I, If they didn't promise anything special to Kickstarter backers and you're not happy about that, don't back it. We'll leave it at that. They, they don't need to. So, moving on. That was the first game off the pilot chain. The next one is a game called Hansa Teutonica. This one I bought when uh, Geektropolis was going out of business, and it was a game that I knew I wanted, but I didn't remember why. Like, I saw it sitting there. I knew it was long out of print, and I'm like, Hansa Teutonica, I want that game. Jay, how much do you want for this game? And he's like, here, 20 bucks. I'm like, all right, here, I want that game. And then I put it on my pile of shame for months. I now remember it was Heavy Cardboard did a podcast review of it. And Heavy Cardboard, if you like heavy games so not gloomhaven i can't lift it but lots of decision points lots of ap lots of thinking in the game longer play times that's the kind of game that heavy cardboard reviews which is a, is a great niche because almost every board game podcast talks about the new hotness 
which I guess I kind of just did with Wasteland Express, but now I'm talking about Hansa Teutonica, so we're kind of in the middle. I know. But, Wasteland Express but, isn't the hotness anymore. It's Dinos or whatever the newest one is. That's. Well, that one's already stuff. funded. People are just waiting for that to show up. But yeah, <laughs> Dinosaur Island. But yeah, it's heavy cardboard does a niche that I enjoy. So I, I anything Edward on that show recommends, I, I tend to check out. I yet to buy a game he recommended and not be happy with. And Hansa is one of those. Uh, so I picked up Hansa. I finally got to play it on Saturday. Brought it out to the FLGS, and holy cow, was the FLGS empty. And then I remembered it's the holiday weekend or the civic holiday or whatever else. The, the holiday no one in Canada understands, but everyone's really happy to get in August where you don't have to work Monday. The random camping weekend. Yes, and that's exactly it. Everyone goes up north, drives past Sean in Hamilton, drives past Toronto, and goes out to cottage country up there. Like my mom left this morning. She's up in cottage country with my uncle. I, it's just it's something everyone does. Um, my Monday night group, I have five people that are supposed to come over. One came over. The rest were camping. So the FLGS was a little empty. But there were two other people there. Hansa Teutonica plays three to five, so I invited them over. They came over. We played it. Oh, wow, was it good. The, there's a slight correlation here to Bruges, which I feel like I'm talking about on every episode, but I've been playing it a lot lately. A really deep, heavy game that plays quick, like like lightning quick. Like We played our first game of Hansa, and I think we were done in 45 minutes, and that was like a learning game we never played before. You don't get heavy games that play in 45 minutes that are good. Like, it just doesn't happen. So we thought maybe it's a fluke, right? So we finished that game. We're closing it, and two more people had showed up at the game store. Actually, a bunch more people showed up. Not a bunch. So six people showed up, but they had their own thing going on. They set up Star Trek Ascendancy, and that was their plan, was to play that all night. Supposedly, really good game. Looks really cool. Uh, sorry, four of the six set up Star Trek Ascendancy. The other two guys came in, guys I know, and I'm like, hey, you guys want to try this game? Because we just played, and it's really good. So, like, sure. So then we played a five-player game. We finished that five-player game in about an hour and 50 minutes. Like, again, that's that's mind-blowing for a heavy Euro game. And the game is not hard in the fact that... So it's you're in medieval Germany building the Hanseatic League which was a league of merchants. And it was a confusing time period where there were no laws for who could be in and who couldn't. So there were a bunch of cities that would claim they were Hansa cities and cities that claim they weren't. And that's the time period that the game represents. And you're playing a merchant house, trying to build offices in the various cities. And the game actually, of all things, reminds me of Ticket to Ride because you're building routes between these cities. And when a route's complete, you build offices. The thing is, there's only five actions you can take in the game, and they're all really simple. It's like, get more guys, um, put guys on the map, replace other people's guys on the map, take guys off the map, and found routes are like the only five things you do. And you got this big map of Germany to do it on. Each individual expansion is really simple. So it's really easy to teach but then the decision points, like where to put your guys and which routes to complete and when to do it and when to cut people off is really fantastic. Very impressed. Sounds great. So that's two. What was our third game? The third one. Warhammer Underworld Shadespire. Ooh. This is one of the new fangled, funky, new... I have Warhammer games that's doing things I don't get. I think I'm getting too old. Um, it is is so odd. Like I I don't know. I like I think the only way we can really get this across is if we give you some of the flavor text. And I, maybe this will sound awesome to you, but I don't know. Well, let's see what we can offer them. Following the destruction of the original Warhammer world by the forces of chaos, 
Sigmar floated aimlessly through outer space, clutching on to the metal core of the previous Warhammer world. After a long passage of time, he was rescued and befriended by the great celestial dragon Dracothian, who led Sigmar to the mortal realms, eight planes of existence connected by portals called Realm Gates, one of which was bestowed upon Sigmar to rule by Dracothian. Souls were drawn to these realms, with some being survivors from the previous world and others new. Sigmar forged alliances with these peoples and their respective gods as civilization was re-established in the mortal realms. This growth was short-lived, however, as the forces of chaos struck again, invading the mortal realms. Led by Archeon, the Chaos dominated seven of the eight mortal realms, sparing only Sigmar's realm, Azir. The civilizations and alliances Sigmar strove to make were ultimately destroyed in the Chaos invasion. Angered, Sigmar created the mighty Stormcast Eternals, and with them led the fight against the Chaos, thus beginning the Age of Sigmar. What? What? Yeah. What, what, that, where's Carl Franz? Where's the uh, Empire? In my Skaven? They blew in, him up. In the pro. The pro. The, I. I they don't. Blew know. it up. It's I, all it, gone. It, it, <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> so, throwing out the fluff, playing the game. Awesome miniatures. Like I haven't kept up with Warhammer, which is pretty obvious. Uh, still hurts. Really awesome miniatures. Snap fit. You don't even need glue anymore. Um, like, blows away anything I used to own or still own. Yes, I own lots of miniatures. They're over uh, right there. Um, beautiful looking rules. Fairly simple. Simple enough. I was able to do the bad thing. We sat down and tried to learn to play from the book at the same time uh, for someone who runs events and tries to give people gaming advice don't do that it's bad learn it ahead of time we could probably do a whole episode on teaching games we don't try to will. learn it from the book there so sean not this sean that other sean yes the same other sean i mentioned before one of the Sean's and I played this game. We played the really simple intro. Skip that. If you buy it, like there's a setup and it tells you where to move the guys. Don't do that. Jump right to the full rules. Really solid, quick game. Like move your miniatures, try to beat up the other guys. Uh, funky dice. So not normal D sixes kind of reminds me of hero quest. You got like hits on the one die and the other guy rolls defense dice and shields so, cancel. Hits. Blood bowl dice. Yeah. Same idea. Games Workshop seems to like those. Always have. Um, but he had the Stormcast Eternals. I was playing the Ravengers, which were some corn guys. Blood for the blood god. And he set up his guys. I set up mine. And one of the neat things in the game is it's got a, a deck building element. Now, not a, a deck building element as in Magic the Gathering, as in build your deck ahead of time. Not deck building like Star Realms, Ascension, modern board gaming deck building where you build your deck as you play. We played with the preset decks, but you get these cards every round and they give you gambits to play or you can upgrade your guys. And the really neat one is you draw quest cards, three of them, and those tell you what you can get points for. And that changes every game. So you have a whole deck of it. And the stuff I had was someone on both sides dies, seven people have died, two people died in one turn, or you killed three people because, well, I was playing corn. Sean's cards were like, defend this, heal one of your characters, um, set up a defensive line. Like, it, it was much, very thematic. The really surprising part, this kind of goes back to Hans and Bruges, was it was also very quick. You literally only play three rounds. In each round, you only get four activations. And on an activation, you activate one miniature, move, and or attack, and that's it. So you literally have 12 activations the entire game so you're ever only ever going to touch your minis 12 times and the game's over which 
is short, especially as I'm sure Sean remembers our Warhammer Fantasy Battle games back when he played his Dark Elves and I played my Orcs and we started on Friday and then Sean's mom got mad at us Sunday so we had to clean it up and I don't think we ever finished a game. Nope. So that's a complete change. Uh, also only needing five minis on one side, three on another is another, another big change. But it was fun. Like It was surprisingly good. It, it's not the best game I own. It's very thematic. There's lots of dice. It's very random. But for a Warhammer game, I was impressed. And part of that, I got to say, is because I played Corn and it looked like I was losing, but I ended up winning the overall fight because enough people died in the battle. Yeah, most of them were mine, but Corn didn't care. So that was pretty cool. Excellent. Uh, and it looks like there's an expansion for Hans uh, Teutonica that gives another map. Nice. We record the show live Thursday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch. And we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. And thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. I see we've got uh, Brian, Commander Root, Decaf Smurf, and Wilt Chamberlain Zero, or Wilt Chamberlain here tonight. Uh, and Wilt is the one who's told us there's uh, some extra stuff there for Hansa. Excellent. Good to see everyone in the chat. Thanks for joining us, Wilt. I'm pretty sure I know exactly who that is. Gamed with him a few times. Someone who has a collection that can rival my own. Excellent. All right. And each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop, where there are a variety of ways to get in touch. We need your questions. We're here to help, but don't know what kind of help you need. Trying to determine what to buy next? Can't find local gamers. Looking for a venue to play? Have friends coming over and want to make it an event and just another game night? Ask away. This week, Dragon Gem from the Lobby, our tabletop bellhop live Twitch chat room asks, what are some good two-player games? That should be quick and easy, right? I don't think Dragon Gem realizes just how huge this question is. There are so many two-player games. People have been sitting down in pairs playing games for all of history. For many, it's the preferred way to play. Yeah, preferred way to play. Player versus player, eye to eye, across the table. Dueling, jousting, um, okay, maybe chess. <laughs> so many genres. So we're going to try something different. We're going to break this into segments. It's the whole how do you eat an elephant, right? One piece at a time. Since there's so much to cover, we're going to skip the featured review this week. Instead, we're going to break down two-player games into different types and genres. We'll break down what these are and some genre... we break down what these are and offer some game suggestions for each. So our categories for this purpose are Euro games, card games, abstract games, miniature games, war games, multiplayer, played for just two, and more. So starting with two-player only Euros, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of two-player Euros, these, by Euros, I mean, you know, soulless cube pushers, your German-style games. It's, it's kind of a dead term at this point. But gamers who have been playing games know the term. It's not, not as thematic, not as random. Usually most of the information's open. Uh, it's Euro games. It's... It's one of the, you hear it so often, you know what it means. Uh, you'll know by the games I mentioned what type of games I'm talking about. So these are games that can only be played by two people that give that that heavier trading in the Mediterranean back and forth. Not Warhammer, we're trying to smash each other and roll lots of dice. The opposite style of game. The first games that come to mind when I think of two-player Euros are these small box games put, that were put out by Z-Man Games. A lot of them are small versions of larger Euro games. So Agri uh, Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small, or Le Havre, The Inland Port. So Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small is like a small version of Agricola, a big multiplayer farming game. 
whereas all creatures big and small strips out all the stuff about feeding your family and is just about raising animals la havre the inland port totally abstracts the market of the game and it's all about building buildings a newer one is caverna cave versus cave which is a newer version of agricola using where you're playing dwarves the best of that group of games, in my opinion, though, was a game called Patchwork from Uwe Rosenberg. Fantastic two-player polyomino game where you're each trying to build a quilt. Uh, my wife and I love this game. We bring it out to coffee shops. We bring it to pubs. We bring it when we go on vacation. We play it in hotel rooms. Really dig the game. Speaking of games played at coffee shops, our old favorite of ours is Lost Cities. This is a two-player card game that has a board but doesn't need it where you're leading expeditions into the jungle, etc. That's the theme. But really, you're just trying to play cards in sequence of different colors. There's a push-your-luck element. And we first found that game at the coffee exchange downtown, Windsor's Best Coffee Shop, run by a, a local gamer who, again, uh, heavy war gamer, great guy, Ron Bala. He's the one that got, actually, my wife into Lost Cities, and she used to go to the coffee shop, and she would play with her sister. And then she convinced me to come down and start playing with her. So that's another fantastic one. If you dig Sid Meier's Civilization or Civ building games, then I strongly recommend Seven Wonders Duel. Seven Wonders is an up to seven player game drafting where you're building Seven Wonders and Civilizations and Techs. Well, Seven Wonders Duel takes that game, distills it down to two players, and in my opinion, is an even better game. Fantastic Civ building game especially with two players. It does some really neat stuff with drafting where the cards are out in front of you with uh, the pyramid style, like the old card games where you can't take the card above until you take the one below it. Really fantastic game. Another heavier. So, so these are all pretty light. Like we can play these at coffee shops. They're played in under an hour. There are a few heavier ones. One of the biggest recommendations people will say is Twilight Struggle. This one was number one on the Board Game Geek for years. Like when I joined Board Game Geek, it was number one and it was there for a very long time. This is a Cold War area control game. Some people argue it's a war game. I push towards area control. Really great game that rewards multiple plays. So learning the deck of cards, learning what can happen in the game makes it way more involved and way more interesting. You get to that chess level where you you know what cards the guy the other guy may have and gambits he might pull off. Personally, I like it, but it's not great. But so many people like that game so much, I have to give it a mention. Now, for big heavy euros, like in multiple ways, because it's a great big box. Almost broke the late rated G thing there. Big box is Fields of Arl. This is another Uwe Rosenberg farming game where you are in a peat bog and you're cutting peat and you're creating tools and you're leveling up your, your various tools and farming equipment and you're sending goods out to distant lands and you play many seasons and half the time you can play on this. It's, it's big, it's deep, it's heavy. And it's only two players. It's You don't get a lot of games like that. I strongly recommend it. Excellent. So the Euro games, I know from my experiences, when you go into a gaming store, there's something that's sort of, I don't know, less accessible about them. They aren't as, as friendly and they have a lot of strange words on them. Some of them have large amounts of German writing on them. <laughs> Are they accessible to a casual gamer? Should people who aren't, you know, considering themselves board gamers or gamers, should they be looking for these and, and going to them? Or should they be brought into them by someone a little more experienced? I would definitely recommend the latter. Um, we talked about Catan on our first episode. That's probably the most well-known Euro game. That's the game that started the German game, the, the Euro game rush. Call them German games because most of these games are literally made in Germany and translated to English and brought over here. Uh, they, I, I agree, they're not quite as accessible. They're not simple. They're not just play a card or roll a die and move a piece. There's a lot more involved. But I don't think anyone should be scared away. Like I wouldn't give a brand new player Fields of Arl to play, but there's no reason I wouldn't teach anyone patchwork. 
it's like anything else. There's easy, simple Euro games, and there's deep, heavy Euro games. Just like there's simple, easy war games, which we'll talk about in a bit. Like, I can play war with a deck of cards. If my cards are higher than yours, I win. Or I can set up Advanced Squad Leader and try to read a rule book that's like this thick and has so many acronyms that I couldn't even get past the intro of the book when I stole my dad's copy to read it. Uh, so there's a scale. Um, your best bet is to talk to someone who knows. Write the bellhop. Ask what some good gateway Euro games are. Catan, Carcassonne. Uh, Ticket to Rides, pretty Euro-y. Even that's, it's kind of on the fence. That's the other thing. I kind of mentioned it earlier. There, there's a, a big meshing going on. The the terms uh, Amerithrash and Euro game, they don't mean as much as they used to. It is very possible to get a highly thematic Euro game now, and it's very possible to get a very structured Ameritrash game or Marathrash game, however you prefer. So I, I don't think there's any reason to be scared of them, but it may help having a friend that knows the games ahead of time that can teach it to you. And if you don't happen to have a friend, you're not only welcome to ask us at the tabletopbellhop.com, but stop by your local FLGS or board game cafe if you're lucky enough to have one in your area and introduce yourself to someone and see if you can find a new game partner. Next up, card games. So these are your two-player only card games. There are a ton of these out there, and the big, the biggest of them all is obviously Magic the Gathering. I can't believe that anyone listening to this right now doesn't know what Magic the Gathering is, but it's an extremely popular two-player only collectible card game. There are a lot of these collectible card games. It's back in the 90s it was kind of a craze it was like every week a new one was coming out and i got bit by it and sean got bit by it my wife got bit by it is it only two player because at one point you could do group games and there were rules has that been modified over the years oh that's a good point i'm calling them two player only card games but a lot of these games do have variant rules to allow multiplayers but, but the by default basic game yeah, the basic game by default is single player. Like, there's something in, I I don't keep up with Magic, but there's something like Two Headed Giant that has to do with playing multiplayers. Uh, other games I mentioned, I'm going to mention, will probably have some rules for playing more players. But mostly, it's my deck versus your deck, eye to eye, seeing who can win. So there's Magic, extremely popular. Um, I'm sure other places are different, but here in Windsor, Yu-Gi-Oh is almost as popular. For younger kids, Pokemon's popular. There are a lot of these. If you are at all interested in them, if you have a game store in your city, I guarantee they sell some form of collectible card game because that's what keeps them in business. These are popular games. Just show up, especially on Friday. Pretty much every local game store, if you go on a Friday, has Friday Night Magic, say, hey, I've heard this magic thing's cool. I want to check it out. Now, more recently, a company called Fantasy Flight Games has released what they call Living Card Games. The whole thing with that is the collectible aspect of Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon isn't for everyone. It's why I got out of it. A living card game is you buy uh, a set. Like when you buy the expansion and expansion comes out, it's 40 cards. You buy all 40 cards at once. You pay one price, you get all of them. There's no random pulls. There's no getting terrible cards. You get an entire deck at once. The really popular ones in that are Android Netrunner, which I hear is being canceled. There's the Star Wars living card game and a few others. What's really cool about these games is organized play. Like I said, if you go to your game store, they probably do um, do tournaments. They have intro nights. Like they're they're very well supported. If I wanted to play Magic, I could literally go on one of five local Facebook groups and say, hey, someone want to play Magic tomorrow, and I'm sure I would find someone to play. They're popular. They're everywhere. They're really accessible in a way they're and, and easy to find. And if you want to learn, uh, there are console and PC games that play the card games uh, True. One, on, one against the computer. So if you don't have anyone nearby... You can sit down in front of your Xbox or in front of your computer and learn the cards with the actual cards from the game. Yep. 
So of all these, I said I'd give some recommendations. I like obviously Magic and that they're popular. Check them out. But the ones I like the most are Ashes: Rise of the Phoenix Born. This is from Plat Hat Games, and I would call it a Magic clone. It's it's trying to do the same thing as Magic: The Gathering, but it fixes some of the issues with Magic. Like Magic, one of the problems if you've if you hadn't played before, even if you have, is mana. You need to have land cards in your deck and you need to draw them to be able to cast the spells to win the game. And if you don't draw that mana, you're not going to win. That random factor is removed in Ashes because it uses dice instead. And at the start of your turn, you roll your dice to figure out what mana you have. And then there are tons of ways to mitigate that. So every card can be played with every die, but better dice can do more things is probably the easiest way to explain it. And you can always discard cards just to re-roll your dice. So it mitigates that, that mana problem. The other thing I thought was really neat in Ashes is when you cast a spell, it stays in play permanently. So in Magic, you're always hoping to get that one card. You need that card. It's got to come up. In this, if you get the spell, you put it on the table, and it's up for the rest of the game, and you can keep casting it every round. What they've done to add the whole you want to draw it part so you still have that feel is if you get multiple copies of the same card, the spell gets better. So you start off and you draw your fireball spell, you put it on the table, you can now cast fireball. Well, later, if you draw another fireball, you can put it on top of the other one. Now you do a better fireball. There's a bunch of other little things like you can attack multiple times. There's no banding, etc. I'm not going to get into details about Ashes, but Ashes is fantastic for a two-player only card game you versus me you can play with the set decks that come with the game or you can do your own deck building personally i tried the deck building but the decks they give you are really well balanced so i tend to just play with what comes in the box the other one i've only recently fallen in love with and part of this is probably because i play it with my daughter so that's awesome on its own is star wars destiny this is a collectible dice game they call it but really, it's a card game. There are dice involved. Actually, it's kind of like Ashes that way. So when you buy the set, you get dice for your characters, but you also get a set of cards. The cards you use to build the deck, you get the cards in your hand, but then your characters are represented by dice, and you roll the dice every turn to see what the character can do that time. So if you're thinking magic, it'd be like summoning a monster, and the monster can do one of six things, and every turn you roll to see what it does, I guess, to kind of tie it together. Maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, Star Wars Destiny, extremely well done. Great looking dice. Fantasy Flight Games, they make good looking stuff. It's good looking stuff. Rule books are very clear. The problem is, it's collectible. So, I, I think I mentioned it when we were doing a week in review previously. We bought the two player starter set from Fantasy Flight Games. Then I went out and bought the latest expansion set. So I picked up the Luke Skywalker starter set and the Boba Fett starter set. And then I also grabbed three booster packs. With all of that, we could not make two legal decks. We could have made one, but not two. So that was a little disappointing. But you know what? My girl loves it. I'm sure I'll go buy more cards and soon enough we'll be able to make legal decks. It's not like I'm bringing her out to play tournaments. It's just the two of us playing. We don't. We can break the rules, right? The last recommendation I have is Star Realms. I was talking about Origins earlier. 2015, went to Origins, went to the White Wizard booth, sat down, played this game, and was like, oh my god, it's like Ascension, but so much better. This is a pure deck builder. Deck builder, again, it's two types of deck builders. Deck builders where you build your deck outside the game. Out of all your cards you own, you decide, I'm going to bring these 40 to play. The other kind of deck builder that I'm talking about here is you start with a set of cards that's the same as everyone else at the table, and there's a market in the middle, and then you use those cards to draft new cards into your hand so your deck builds as you play, thus deck builder. I kind of wish there were two different turns for the two things. I'm sure I could coin them, but getting everyone to follow is not going to happen anyway. So we'll just try to differentiate. Star Realms is the latter. You start off with two scouts and no, two fighters and eight scouts in your deck, five cards. You shuffle them. One does damage to the bad guys. The other one lets you buy new cards. There's a bunch of different factions. What's done really well in Star Realms is you get combos for playing cards of the same factions. So it rewards you buying in sets in the middle of the table and both people are buying from it so sometimes you can't build the set you want to build for I think for a deck 
you will play that probably 30, 40, 50 times just with that deck. There's expansions out. There's something called Gambits. They put out new sets every now and then. But just the core game that came out in 2015, I'm still playing. We, we play it often enough. Excellent. Um, I know we were talking... Uh, I haven't kept up with Magic. I, uh, I made myself stop many years ago. <laughs> um, that was a large financial investment at one time. Uh, yeah. But with Pokemon, I find Pokemon is wonderful, and it's actually wonderful for all ages. Um, my kids got started in it, and my son actually learned to read mostly by working on oh, Pokemon awesome. cards. Uh, he goes to a French school, so his English was Pokemon, uh, and he wanted to play with he wanted to play with his dad, so he learned how to read the cards. Um, that is awesome. But the rules are very simple, and one of the best parts about Pokemon is most of the rules are on the table in front of you. You got a playing mat that works, uh, and I, everything's laid out right there in front of you, and all the cards are similar enough. Plus, you get pre-made decks really easily. You can you can build your own decks. But Pokemon has a lot of starter decks of different varieties available. So you can go and buy two starter decks or a two deck pack and immediately start playing. Everything you need is in there. Um, and that's one of the great things about Pokemon. It makes it a really easy to get into game and easy to get addicted and start <laughs> going on walks and collecting Pokemon as you stroll down the waterfront. Uh I remember the uh, the D and D game we used to play. What was that called? Spellfire. 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 Have... There, there's something I did not mention about collectible card games. One of the problems with collectible card games, actually, all these games, is power creep. So, for the companies to keep making money, they have to keep selling cards, and to keep selling cards, they need to put out better cards than the last set. And some games handle this better than others. Magic nowadays actually discontinues sets. I, I don't know how big the window is, but to, to stop that problem from happening is you get to play sets from a certain release. And when that release is done, you're not allowed to play with those cards anymore. In, in official tournaments, you can still play at home. No one shows up at your house and kicks down the door and takes all your cards. It's not paranoia. Uh, but... Spellfire was a classic D&D game where it so had that problem. Like, it was just power creep. Every set just had bigger numbers. And it was also a problem where the rarer cards were better. So that's something else that Magic tries really hard to do. Like, one of the most powerful cards in the game may be a common card. Excuse me. Whereas in Spellfire, the rare had a 15 on it, and the commons had twos, and a 15 beats a two. Like, that's just the way it goes. So, yeah, that was my dad's favorite. He loved it because he had the money and he could spend all the money and he would beat us every time. So, hey. But we all we always played his cards, too. So, you know, we just all dug into his collection and made decks. Uh, that's I guess true. I never had to deal with the buying problem on that one. Yes. All right. Well, let's take a break from two player gaming goodness and we'll cover some announcements. You can find us on all the major podcast platforms and an uncut video version on YouTube. If there's a way you prefer to listen to podcasts and you don't find us on it, give us a shout and we'll see what we can do. I'm working on getting us onto Plex right now, which has a new beta podcast option. Uh, okay. I know we're also striving to get on iHeartRadio, but that could take a long time. Apparently, yes. Uh, a podcast I know just announced they got on it after a year of trying. Well, who knows? Once we're bigger than the Dice Tower, there shouldn't be a problem. Easy. So if you're here live listening, which I see a few of you are in the chat, uh, you're all invited to our launch party. It's in three days, Saturday. Digitally speaking, someone's going to get upset oh. if you knock on our door. True, true. That's right. Saturday, August 11th, I'm going to host a 12-hour gaming extravaganza. We're going to stream the entire thing right here on our Twitch channel. That's at twitch.tv, tabletop bellhop, for those of you not watching live. If you are, you know already. <laughs> I hope, unless you just wandered in. The stream will be running from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. Eastern on the 12th. 
Throughout the day, we're going to have some really cool special events. Such as a live per in-person recording. It was the first time the two of us have actually been able to record next to each other live in person. I've got a board game in my fridge right now. Yep, my fridge. It's a copy of Catan Chocolate Edition I picked up just for this event. In honor of our first episode where we could covered Catan games. We're going to do a live play of that sometime during the day. And what's a party without presents? We're going to be having giveaways during the event, and anyone in the lobby, our live chat room at the time, will be eligible to win. Just remember what old Jack Burton does when the earth quakes and the poison arrows fall from the sky and the pillars of heaven shake. He plays Big Trouble in Little China, the game? Well, that's what we're going to do, and we're going to stream it live. We'll be inviting guests to stop by the camera and say a few words, speaker's corner style. And who knows what else? You're going to have to join us on the 11th from 2 to 2 to find out. Note, this is an open house. You don't have to be here the whole time. I don't expect you to be here the whole time. I'll be there the whole time. But stop in, say hi, enjoy the party. We'll hope to see you there. And now for the podcast. If you stopped by on the weekend, we'd like to thank you for taking part. And I hope you enjoyed your time. I know we did. I hope. If seeing us live on Twitch isn't enough, you can find both Sean and I live at Queen City Conquest in September. This is a smaller local con hosted at the Buffalo Niagara Convention Center in Buffalo, New York. This will be our first official con appearance. No, we're just attending. It's not like we're special guests or on their guest list. We're just going to be there hanging out with the crew from the Misdirected Mark. And now... Back to two-player games with a look at abstract two-player games. Now, what are abstract two-player games? So these are games that are so far from theme that you, you can't even tell if the game has a theme. Like, can anyone really tell you the theme in chess? Like, they'll tell you it's a war, right? Like, there's a horsey, so it represents a knight. Like, come on, there, there's no theme there. The horse is or trying go. to jump the queen. Oh, wait. Yeah. G-rated game. <laughs> that Oh, where were we? Two player only abstract games. Yes. What, what's abstract? Okay. Background in chess. Everyone knows what it is. All right. So you can tell me the chess is about a battle, but what's the background in Go? What, what am I doing? Or or backgammon? Like, what what's the theme there? Is is there one? Was there one? Does it represent something? Maybe. But anyway, that's, that's basically what I mean by abstract. It's a lot of the traditional games are abstract. Almost all your card games are abstract. You're playing queens and kings and hearts and diamonds. It doesn't mean anything. What I'm really looking at, though, are the more modern versions. Some of my personal favorites are the Duke. If you are a chess fan but don't want to play chess but like the feel of it, the Duke is a fantastic game. Two-player-only game, smaller board. The neatest part on the Duke is you don't have to remember what the pieces do. You start with your duke on the board, two other pieces. Every turn, you either move a piece that's there, or you pull a new one out of the bag and you get a new troop. The cool part is that all the moves for the piece are right on the physical piece itself. And then the killer app of it is once you move the piece, you flip it over and the moves change. It's brilliant. Really changes the way the game plays. There's some memorization to it, learning what the different pieces do. Extremely tactical. Very good game. And actually, I have to credit Will Chamberlain, who's in our chat, for bringing that out to uh, a local gaming event many years ago. Along with the Duke, another chess-like game that I really like is Onitama. This is an Asian-themed game where supposedly you represent martial arts having a duel. No, it's a bunch of guys on a grid, and you play cards, and the cards tell you how the pieces move. Now, what's brilliant in Onitama is that every game you only have five cards in play. You have two on your side, two on the enemy's side, and one in the middle. And as soon as you use a card, it goes to your enemy, and you get that one in the middle. So the five moves that are possible in the game are the same for the whole game. It's perfect information. So that's another thing that's often true in abstract games like this, is that you know everything out there. The Duke is pretty close, but you're drawing random tiles. So by dra drawing random tiles, there is a random element. But anything on the table, you can always see. Uh, another group of games, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's like GIFP, G-I-F-P. It's the GIFP 
project. I don't remember the name of the company that's putting it out, but you can look it up on Wikipedia. It was some designer's goal to put out a game, and then every time you buy another game in the series, it's also an expansion for GIF. Very neat concept. Other games in the series have just as silly names. Yinch, Zertz, Punked. I, uh, if you look in the show notes, you can see spelling of those later. Uh, very cool components. They're like Bakelite or Stone. Very abstract games with dots on the map. And they're they're about capturing pieces and stuff. Uh, the other problem with abstract games are kind of hard to describe. You're putting pieces on the map, moving them to capture other pieces. Just check them out. Check out the GIF games. They're really good. Uh, there's even some co-op games now this is something i missed on the blog post where i covered this topic but i had a lot of people ask me after i posted the blog about any good two-player co-op games and the one that immediately came to mind is one called and then we held hands this is what they considered almost a date game again i'm going to tell you the theme but really it has nothing to do with what you're actually doing you put down the board and you're trying to play cards and the person on the other side is trying to play cards, and you're trying to make your markers meet, and it's supposed to represent uh, a discussion between two friends, and like you play angry cards and whatever. You play cards, and you can't talk to each other, so you're trying to figure out what the other player is going to play to get your two markers to meet. It's a very neat game, but really the theme, whatever. Uh, another one everyone kept telling me I had to try was called Fog of Love. That's a newly released one. That one uh, I haven't played myself, so I couldn't tell you about that. Another fantastic abstract that my wife used to carry in her purse is Hive. This is a game with Bakelite tiles, hex-shaped tiles with pictures of bugs on them. And one of the amusing things about Hive, there's a meme out there, especially on board game with people playing it in weird places. We have literally played Hive in my pool when I had a pool, just because you can. It is a really good abstract game where you are trying to surround the other player's queen bee with your pieces, and the picture of what insect is on the hex tells you how it moves. So ants can move all around the outside of the hive. Spiders can only move three pieces. Grasshoppers can jump over the hive. Really good game. Yet again, like I said, abstract. It's a bunch of pictures of things. I guess it kind of looks Hive-like. Abstract two players. Best thing about Hive, though, is, like I said, my wife put it in her purse. Deanna had it with her everywhere. So we, whatever, we'd be at the bar drinking, pull out a game of Hive. We'd be at a restaurant, pull out Hive. I know I mentioned we kind of did that with Patchwork. Hive's even more portable. And the nice part about Hive, if you are out drinking and you spill anything, it's big light tiles. Who cares? Sounds great. And uh, we should probably cover ourselves in case the... Uh... Internet hates us afterwards. It could be pronounced GIFT, GIFP, or GIFP. Let's. Oh, God. <laughs> so let's uh, shrink things down a bit and talk about miniature games. I mentioned Warhammer Shade Spire, but there are a lot of miniature games. This Miniature games are, are almost a hobby on their own. Um. There are people who only do miniature gaming. Actually, it's they're, they're what they call lifestyle games. If you get heavy into miniature gaming, you are going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time building your armies. And for some people, that's awesome. I did it. I every now and then get tempted to do it again, but it's not really my thing. Now, the games I'm talking about are Warhammer. You got Warhammer Age of Sigmar now or the even more popular Warhammer 40,000. There's War Machine and Hordes, which I guess are compatible, and the local people call it Warma Hordes, which is still one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. I like a Horde Machine. Doesn't Horde Machine sound cooler than Warma Hordes? Warma Hordes sounds like something the doctor is diagnosing you with. I'm. Yeah, I uh, whatever. <laughs> not not my game. But the big thing with all of these games is you have to buy armies. Like you're, you're even even the Age of Sigmar I talked to, or the Shade Spire. You still like the game came with two factions. If I wanted to play more, I have to go buy more miniatures. You then have to bring these miniatures home and you have to put them together, and that involves having to clean them, like clean them as in give them a bath because there'll be mold release on them and like cut off the little trim on them and stuff. Then you got to paint them. Like it's a lot of work. The cool thing about miniature games, though, is 
they're popular enough that you can pretty much get a miniature game for everything. Like there's fantasy, sci-fi, historic. There is a miniature game. Like there's like we played Blood Bowl back in the day. This is a game about football with fantasy races. Well, there are spin-offs on that. There is a roller derby miniature game out there nowadays. Like it's out there. I think I one of the things one of those once. <laughs> I remember you were writing a volleyball one. That's years true. I years did ago. do. I did do a Blood Bowl version of volleyball. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. That was a long time ago. Very. What's cool is times are changing. What you can get nowadays are pre paints. Fantasy Flight's pretty much one of the leaders in this with their uh, Star Wars X Wing. Here's a miniature game where you don't have to paint anything. You don't have to assemble anything. You buy your ship. You bring it home. It's together it looks fantastic like they're well painted um start there's armada there were this is um hero clicks from whiz kids now okay maybe the paint jobs aren't quite as fantastic on those but again you can get an army of x-men and fight them against an army of the legion of doom actually even weirder with hero clicks is you can make an army of x-men and have them fight the starship enterprise but as I said, all genres, hero clicks, they all mesh. It's kind of messed up. Kind of cool, though. Now, if you're not into the big army thing, there are skirmish games. Basically, as far as I can tell, those are companies just trying to hook you. Like, here, no, play our skirmish rules. You only need about 20 models. And then we'll sell you the big version. But hey, who knows? One of the more popular ones I love the miniatures for is called Malifo. It's a very um, noir, dark... Not Cthulhu, but more twisted horror looking miniatures in like a haunted city. Very cool looking minis. Shade Spire, I mentioned earlier, is one of those um, skirmish games. From what I hear, War Machine's supposed to be, but every time I show up at the local game stores and see them playing, they seem like they have a lot more than five models on the field. So is now, War this Shade Spire similar to the old uh, War Band, Chaos Warband uh, idea that used to they used to run? Uh, Shade Spire is more of a board game. There's no tape measure. There's no measuring. You do have to build your force. You do have to build your deck. But you are looking at like five to ten models each on a board with hexes moving square by square. So it's a little more so structured version of the of, of the old Warhammer, the Chaos War bands. Yeah, okay. exactly. Now, of all things, people never believe me on this one, but my favorite miniature war game is Mars Attacks. Like, uh, yes, okay. based on okay, the okay. movie. Okay. 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 Yep, that one. It's good. It's really good. It, they managed to put out a miniature game that doesn't need a tape measure. Like, I'm not saying a board game. Like, this is miniatures. Put out your map. Put out your scenery. Spend points to buy your army. You spend points to build your army, and we're going to face off. And what they did is this brilliant system where the board's divided into squares, and your guys can move so many squares. Now... The, the killer app part is when you put your guy move into a square, you decide where in the square he's standing. And that's where your positioning matters. So if you put your guy in the right spot, so he's hiding behind the right crates or whatever, because line of sight is real line of sight. Like you get down on miniature level and take a look. So movement's abstract. It's like, hey, I move my guy three squares, but then you got to decide where in there he is. And that's where your tactics come in. There's no wheeling and magician musicians or formations it's all skirmish and then the other cool part is it's a card-based game and it kept all the humor so in mars attacks you really can have flaming cows bounce across the field and take out some of your opponents it is really good i strongly recommend people check it out i know it sounds like like who's gonna play mars attacks over warhammer well okay there's your problem with mars attacks finding other people to play but fantastic game a, and where can you go wrong with flaming cows on the battlefield? Exactly. Exactly. And speaking of where else, where else can you come to our lobby and find mental health professionals discussing the games that they use in their practices to help kids every day? And that's great. nice. So thank you for uh, Brian and Wilt for uh, adding that discussion into our uh, chat room here. Uh, it's great to see. And it's great to hear about how games like the ones we talk about every week can help, uh, especially kids who are struggling and having problems. Uh, awesome. Yeah. 
that's why we want more people to come come join in the chat interact they're having a great conversation while we talk i hope it doesn't mean we're boring it got started by our conversation so there we go it's it's okay we're carrying on but we're not done yet with two-player games so now war games blood for the blood god sorry um yes war games that one kind of fit better in the last one. Miniature game. Right here, I'm not talking about miniature game. What I'm looking at here are your hex encounter games. This is your general standing over a battlefield, one side of the table versus the other, 200 little cardboard chits on hexes in front of you. Very complex, usually historically accurate. They're usually more detailed and more simulationist than miniature war games. Now, of course, there are some crossover between the two, but what I'm looking at here are your your GMT games, your Academy games, your Columbia Block games, your Command and Colors games, your, your heavier, more simulation war games. This, again, is almost a genre on its own. There are war gamers out there that only play war games and love their war games. People who will redo the Battle of Waterloo every Saturday for years and still enjoy doing so. I will admit I am not a huge fan of Hex Encounter War games. There are some I like, so I don't have nearly as many recommendations as in other areas. My personal favorite are the Columbia Block games. So this takes the chits and instead kind of stands them up. And by doing that, by putting the information on a block, it adds a fog of war. So now when I'm looking at my opponent over the battlefield, I can't see what his troops are. I can see where they are. So I can say, hey, he's got guys over there, but I can't tell what guys those are. So that even harkens back a bit to, you know, classic Stratego, which actually I think kind of fits in this category. The other thing the Columbia Blocks games do is by standing the, the blocks on their side is it allows you to twist them which lets you put different stats on each edge of the chit so that you can have something happen when the unit takes damage or gets healed or, well, different games do different things. And most of them, it's as they get damage, you turn it to the right and the stats change, usually for the worse. I have seen Wizard Kings, I think is another one where you can actually level up your guys and they turn the other way and get better. So really neat. You take your chits that are out on the board, you stand them up, and now you have a new way to play. Of those games, my favorite is Hammer of the Scots. This lets you play out Braveheart. One side's William Wallace, the other's, I forget his name, English King. Charles. You play the two forces. Yes, maybe. I think. Probably. Someone will probably don't, correct us at some point. Don't quote me on that, but I think. <laughs> you, you at least picked the king. That's better than I did. But yes, you, you get to play out that battle. Fantastic game. My second favorite style of game in this group is called the Command and Colors series. These are from a designer, Richard Borg. Started off with a Civil War game. That one I don't personally own. But what he did in his game is a couple things. He made it card driven. And he took the battlefield, so all your hexes, and divided it in thirds. So you have your center, your left flank, your right flank. Which I think my video swapped, so that probably just made me point the wrong way. But (laughs) you have your center and your two flanks. And then you have cards, and they'll tell you to command two units on the left rank, or another card will say command one unit in each of the, the sections. And then another card might be command units on the right. So that's the command part. Now the colors part is each unit's color coded. So you can have like footmen are green and archers are red, and I don't remember the colors off the top of my head. And other ones are blue. Well, the way that works is when you roll dice to hit. And some command and color games mean you roll the dice, and if you roll the color of your unit, you hit. Other command and color games are the opposite, where you're trying to roll the color of the guy you're trying to kill. But what this means when you're playing, it's really simple, whichever way it is, is I use these cards to decide who to activate, and then when I attack, I just roll the dice and compare colors. Really brilliant, and still gets that somewhat simulation feel of moving guys across a battlefield and different flanks. And it do some really neat stuff with asymmetric play 
where if it's a off-sided battle, like say you were playing Agincourt, where there's a ton of archers on one side and it was pretty much a massacre, and you're trying to recreate that, well, the guy with all the archers gets more cards, so he has more options. Like it's really well balanced. Now there's a ton of Command and Color games. My personal favorite is Command and Color Ancients. This does the whole Rome thing throughout history, right? Gaelic Wars, Caesar, Rome. Another one that's really cool is Battle Lore. So what Battle Lore does is it takes the Command and Color system and fantasy flights it up to be all fantasy. It's griffins and demons versus, I don't know, fantasy creatures. I don't remember if they're elves or whatever, but you have like the good guys versus the bad guys, and you've got a griffin on one side and a rock on the other side, and you can summon golems, and but still uses that same system of the cards. Now it adds in a bunch of special rules for magic and so on. That's the cool one. Like if you prefer thematic games as opposed to dry historic games. So, so, oh, yep, go ahead. <laughs> nope. Go for it. No, no, I always uh, miss, miss timing. Go ahead. Advanced. Was pod. <laughs> yes. So then there's the, the older war games. These, some people love. I mentioned it up above. Advanced Squad Leader is still out there. This is one of the most classic hex encounter chip based war games. I don't know if this was ever true back when I was part of the Windsor gaming society, people used to claim that the actual military used advanced squad leader for training. Now that it's time of the internet, I could look that up and I never thought to, but back in the day, that was the rumor was advanced squad leaders, what the actual army uses to simulate battles. This is a hardcore simulation chit game like there's simple rules but if you get into the full rules there's like shell shock there's trauma there's morale rules there's trying to move your like it, it's crazy it's trying to actually simulate a battle and give historically accurate results not for me people love it now there's the really geeky version of advanced squad leader called starfleet battles that is hex encounter super detailed star trek Literally, you're the captain of a ship or multiple ships, and you have to decide every turn how to spend your energy. And then you play through a series of phases called impulses. And depending on how quick your ship is, it moves in different impulses. And when you fire a photon torpedo, every round it's going to move two hexes. And then next round it's going to move two hexes. And then the Klingon guy is sitting there, and you have to plan your moves ahead of time so you don't know what the other guy's doing. So he looks like the Klingon's going this way, and then he turns. It's heavy intense when you're reading the rule book it's like section 3.2.3 c when the klingon ship is on its side and there's a starfleet cross cluster within three hectares do this it's it's nuts i have actually tried that one it's it's dated it's interesting but there's people who love them it's kind of neat to check out now there's more modern versions of them starfleet academy i think is the one i forget the name of the other one. I've checked those out. They're simpler, but still way over my head. One that just got announced at Gen Con that surprised me is a new edition of Battletech is coming out. Now that is a classic. That is mech battles, huge giant mechs, like bigger than Robotech, like big mechs, bigger like skyscraper size mechs battling each other. And this is another heavy war game. You've got a sheet for each of your mechs and it's got little circles you have to fill in and you've got a list of equipment and you got to track how far you moved every turn because it generates heat and you got to compare that heat to your heat sinks and make sure your mech doesn't overheat and you got to count ranges and you got to worry about cover and then if there's a spotter and big, heavy, complex, but fun game about big battling mechs. Can't tell Pacific Rim came out recently, can you? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that has anything to do with Battletech coming back up possibly uh, so when we're talking about war games a lot of people think um of some of the classics uh, axis and allies or even risk uh now do you count those as two-player games or are those multiplayer games that will work with two people but not ideal does anyone actually play risk with two people can you even do that i've never tried it i i would think most most war games where you're scale out so most of these hex encounter games, this is you're looking at one battle, so you got two sides fighting, right? Once you scale out to Axis and Allies or Risk or Civilization or any of the bigger ones, I think you need more people. 
like I, I'll admit, I've never tried them two player myself, and it doesn't sound like much fun. It's at least with three people you can negotiate. Like if one guy's winning, it's like, hey, let's team up, and then of course you betray the guy at the end, so you win. Well, you don't get that with two people. It just you know just keep bashing each other. Seems like you'd be better off playing something else. They do call it a two player game on their own website. So, wow, well, I never tried it myself. If anyone has tried Risk two player, please let us know how that turned out. So, on the multiplayer games that are great with two, which ties into what Sean just asked. So up to this point, I've tried to cover games you can only play two. Um, I know there are a couple that have some special rules, but like now we're talking about games that like play six players, four players regularly, and that's how the game's expected to play. Once you open that up, there are so many more options. Like there were already a lot. Now there's more. Like, I'm just going to fire some of these off, like Clank, Ascension, Terraforming Mars. All of those are just as good with two players as they are with four. Clank is fantastic. Deck building game where you're trying to sneak into a dungeon, grab some treasure and get out before the dragon kills you. Ascension, it's one of the pure deck builders. Like I talk about Star Realms being good. Well, Ascension is the good four player version, very similar with a magic theme, but still plays really good too. Terraforming Mars, which is one of the best games ever. I love that game. Plays just as good with five players as it does with two. Then you got games that are actually better with two players carcassonne everyone talks about carcassonne as a gateway game probably about as well known as Catan. playing that two player is one of the most cutthroat games if you both know the rules and you're good at cutting off farms and buildings it's a great two player cutthroat game uh castles of burgundy one of the best stefan felds ever made many many people say it plays better two player than three or four i don't mind it three and four but two player sweet spot cuts it down to about an hour and then one of my favorites it's a hidden gem no one else seems to know this game is attica i picked this up at harry tarantula up in toronto my wife and i love this game this is um ancient greece city building game that's more abstract than anything else where you're playing cards trying to build every city on your board at the same time trying to make sure the other player doesn't reach from one temple to another because if they do that they win instantly fantastic two players actually i wouldn't suggest ever playing at three or four players and one of the things you do in that game is you steal the extra components for the other players and use them to mark your cities because really it was a two-player game they put a four on the box race for the galaxy uh, the retheme of Sam Juan, well, and so much more nowadays. It's got some rule variants to play two players. Like, you have to add extra cards in, and you get two actions a turn instead of one. But oh my God, it's so good two player. You play that with five people, and you're looking at a long game. Like, it's still good, but oh, with two, it just sings really good. But one note, though, like you changing the rules there, that is something I is is a bad sign to me. Race pulls it off. But I am usually not a fan of games that have special rules for two players. Like uh, a good example of a popular game with that is Alhambra. You get Alhambra, it's a three, four player game. It's fantastic. And then you get to the back of the book and like to play with two players, you play with a ghost player and you set a hand of cards. That, no, like you just change the game. It's not Alhambra. Anymore. You, you, you ruined it by putting in this stupid two player variant. Like personally, if note to game designers and publishers like if the game's not designed for two players put three to four players on the box don't come up with silly stupid rules to make it two player only and sorry that was a little then they're cutting out part of their market and we can't have that <sighs> well would you rather have that or someone buy the game and be disappointed and then never buy anything from that publisher again just saying they they <laughs> their marketing people are telling them whether, something else so back to some other multiplayer games. A couple Japanese-themed games I really like. Takanoko. This is a game where you have the cutest little panda figure, and he's moving around the board trying to eat bamboo. And your other figure is the gardener who's getting frustrated trying to cultivate the bamboo. That is really good two players. I still like it with three or four. Then talking about Carcassonne being cutthroat. Wow, Tokaido. This is the most zen game that's ever been made. The entire point of the game is to walk to Takaido. This is a road in Japan that goes uh, to Edo, the capital. And it's known for being very picturesque. Well, in this game, you walk along the path, you meet people, you stop at the hot springs, you work at a farm for a bit to make money, you collect food or you collect trinkets, you eat fantastic food, and you look at the vista. Like, that's literally the goal of the game. It, it's the most zen thing ever. Until you play two-player, 
And oh my God, when that person takes that spot you need and you can't go buy your collectible because they went to the farm before you could get there. Oh, you just want to. Yeah, it's Zen. Walk the path. Fantastic two player game. Valeria Card Kingdoms. This was another one that came out at Origins. Um, we showed up at their booth, tried this game, and I just had to buy it. It's um, a tableau builder kind of mixed with a deck builder where you're building up your engine by playing your cards in front of you. The year we got that into, uh, got it at Origins, my wife and I must have played 30 times. Like, it was nuts. We went to the Secret Cabal meetup, another excellent board game podcast. We went to the Secret Cabal meetup. Everyone's drunk and drinking and having beers and playing Strike. And uh, Happy Salmon was really popular. We're over in a corner in a booth drinking our beer, playing game after game of Valeria Card Kingdoms. Lance, the undead Viking, came over. He's like, oh, Valeria. Played a game with him. It was awesome. Really enjoy Valeria Card Kingdoms with two players. Just got my copy of Brass just last week. It's still sitting in a box over there. That one was really good two players as well. It has some special rules for two players where you cut off part of the board, but the base game's still the same. I'll admit I haven't tried the new printing yet, but the original was really good. Then we've got the multiplayer abstracts. We talked about abstracts before. Well, there's some really good multiplayer ones that play just as good with two. You've got Ingenious, Quirkle, or have I mentioned a game Azul before? Maybe once or twice or three or four <laughs> times. Yeah, pretty much every week in review I mentioned it just a few times. These are games that, uh, again, abstract, you're matching patterns, you're trying quirkle is pretty much um scrabble with shapes uh we bring these games my wife and i bring these out with for our anniversary we went to the grove ale house out in kingsville ontario fantastic place where our hotel one room was literally attached to the brewery and you went outside a door and there was a bar there and we had our own private bar well I, that whole weekend we were out sitting at that bar and we had a game of azul going on over Azul fits small footprint. It's fantastic for that. Uh, some favorites of my wife are word games, and here's a classic. But Boggle, Boggle is still great two players. There's a slightly more modern game, Banana Gram. You can pretty much get everywhere. Any uh, education store should have it, where you're. It's basically Scrabble without the board. You're trying to put the words together, and you're not restricted. There's a more modern deck builder that's a word game called Hardback. That one's also really good two players. Well, that's a lot of games to be certain. Oh, but there's so many more. I didn't get to dexterity games. You've got Hamster Roll or one of my kids' favorites, Hey, That's My Fish. I think that may be enough for now. We don't want to keep people up all night long. Okay, okay, I'm done. Just know there's a crazy amount of awesome two-player games out there. One final tip. If you go to Board Game Geek and look up a game, there's a section that lists the number of players. Just underneath that, there's a little note that says best and a number. That is fantastic information that I found to be very accurate. For example, Azul says best with two. It is a great way to find out if a game's worth playing two-player only. All right. If you have any other specific questions about how a certain game's play, game about how a certain game plays, feel free to ask the bellhop. That's why we're here. Now we've got a lot of coverage here, but if you're looking for something to read, take your time with, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where the bellhop has covered this topic in blog form. Remember, if you've got a burning question, you can head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop one word, and support us at the good tip or better level, and your question will get bumped to the top of the list. All right. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and thank you to our backers, Brian Kurtz there in the chat room. Thank you. Bueller. Bueller. All right. And looking back into the lobby... Oh, I see our moderator is doing her job. Absolutely. Thank you, Deanna. Absolutely. So we've uh, we've definitely got a larger population in the chat room this week. It's great to see. Excellent. 
and uh, keep the conversation going. And again, we'll uh, once the live show is over, we'll take a uh, direct conversation right to the chat room. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com and drop by tabletopbellhop.com where you can also find regular posts, including detailed answers to questions, game reviews, the weekend review, and more. I'm also working to build a list of all the tabletop gaming podcasts, Twitch channels, and blogs out there. So step uh, stop by, check out the master list. If you don't see your favorite show on there, please let me know. There's You can use the uh, Ask the Bellhop or send the notes, or you can comment right on the post or send a note to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at Patreon dot com slash tabletop bellhop we're still tweaking the patreon rewards listed now shouldn't be changing so if you see something you like we're not going to mess with that but we are looking at adding more reward and potentially more reward tiers we're also open to input what would you like to see us offer well that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight for those of you here live thank you for joining us and hang around in the penthouse suite for an off the books unless you're a patron after show don't forget our launch party this Saturday, 2-2 two two EDT, twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop. Also, big thanks to our lobby marauder. Uh, lobby marauder. Wow. Well, she did boot someone earlier. You Thank you, D. Remember, join us here on Twitch every Thursday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live podcast to hit your podcatchers at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.